So this morning we're going to continue with our mini-series on how the church is a living family. Uh, last week TJ had kicked us off in that series by looking at how it is we can be a loving family through giving. Um, and in his message, one of the things I picked up and the thing that was most emphasised was that uh, we're all called to make much of Jesus through sacrificial and generous giving. And that can be in terms of our finances, but it's also about our resources, our gifts and our time. And we're reminded is that when we were given that manner, when we give sacrificially, we not only honour God, but we emulate the, the character of Christ and our Christian life. So it's something we need to dwell on. I've been asked this morning to speak on how, as a church family, uh, how we can be a loving church family through ministry. And to frame that message, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse uh, 5 through to 12. So if you've got your Bible with you, you can follow me along. It's the CSB I'm reading from. So starting in verse 5, it says, <clears throat> I will come to you after I pass through Macedonia, for I will be travelling through Macedonia, and perhaps I will remain with you, or even spend the winter, so that you may send me on my way wherever I go. I don't want to see you now just in passing, since I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord allows. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a wide door for effective ministry has opened for me, yet many oppose me. If Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear while with you, because he is doing the Lord's work, just as I, as I am. So let no one look down on him. Send him on his way in peace, so that he can come to me, because I am expecting him with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brothers, but he was not at all willing to come now. However, he will come when he has an opportunity. God bless the reading of his word. And one of the things that's most noticeable about that passage of scripture is that there's no explicit teachings, there's no explicit exhortations contained in it. It really just is an encouragement to the Corinthian church to look after Timothy when it comes to staving him. Rather, what's expressed is a rough outline of Paul's travel plans and when he can it roughly expect the Corinthian church to expect him in the city. So I've got to be honest, when I read it, I thought I'd draw the short straw. <laughs> I went, what am I going to talk about? And how wrong was this? Because I can tell you, at half nine this morning, I was cutting this down. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot in it. And one of the things that helped me was I came across a commentary with John MacArthur, and I'm going to be honest, I'm really indebted to it, because it was so rich in breaking this down. So uh, what I'm going to say this morning is loosely based in his kind of outline of this passage. Uh, so in, in his commentary, MacArthur suggests that what Paul writes about in these verses is fundamental to the work of the Lord. And as a consequence, there's much we can learn and there's much we can grasp from it about how it is we undertake ministry in a, in a manner which is loving and effective. Specifically, he states in the passage, he emphasises two principal tasks which will appear in the PowerPoint, which are critical to effective mission. And these are evangelising and edifying. So this is what the passage is really stressing. Moreover, he suggests that these two tasks are underpinned by a range of factors which are all relative, eh, all relevant, sorry, to effective ministry, and it's things that we should consider as a loving church family. So the different aspects relevant to evangelizing and edifying, including having a plan and having a vision, being flexible, being committed, thinking about how it is we respond to opposition to the gospel, and being together, togetherness or teamwork, if you want to call it that. So this will essentially be the areas I'm looking at this morning. So let's dig in how it is we can best undertake the Lord's work in the Lord's way, bearing in mind these different aspects of evangelism. But before we do that, I'm going to uh, just briefly pray. So Father, we would ask that you would be with us this morning as we examine your holy word. May your spirit guide our hearts as we examine each of these verses, so that we're challenged and changed wherever necessary to be more effective in ministry. And may you make it clear to, us, to all of us gathered here this morning how it is we can best love others individually and collectively eh, through the proclamation of the gospel and through the edification of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Amen. So we'll start with eh, planning and vision. So let me read eh, verse 5 again. It says, I will come to you after I pass through Macedonia, for I will be travelling through Macedonia. One of the things when you, when you look at Paul's ministry, one of the most noticeable aspects of it is that he was always intentional and he was always strategic about how he would serve the Lord. 
And in particular, it suggested that he spent his time in Ephesus planning and marking out how it was he would serve the Lord in his subsequent visits to Macedonia, to Corinth, and Jerusalem. He had it all mapped out well in advance. Another recognable, uh, recognizable aspect, uh, aspect of Paul's ministry is he was consum consumed with a desire to preach the gospel and build up the strengths. And that was often to the detriment of his own comfort and his own well-being. For Paul, there was always more to do. There was always more souls to be saved. There was always brothers and sisters in Christ in need of encouragement, in need of edification. There was always one more mission to complete in Christ in Christ's behalf. But critically, there was always a plan and always a vision for how it was he would do that. Nothing was ad hoc or led to chance. So another discernible aspect of Paul's ministry is that someone whose personal plans and vision for his own life was in complete alignment with the Lord's plan and vision in his life. There was no disconnect. They were completely congruent. So put simply, Paul planned to live his life in a way which was completely in step with the commands of the Great Commission. TJ had briefly touched on the Great Commission last week, but I'm just going to read out, read it out just to remind us what it is the Lord's plan is for each of our lives here this morning. So reading in Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20, it says, The eleven disciples travelled to Galilee, to the mountains where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and <coughs> of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what we see in Paul is a man whose life was dedicated to living out the Great Commission in a way that was carefully considered and intentional. He had a plan and vision for how he would enhance the gospel and make disciples. So what can we learn from him as a church family? Well, there's two things we can all ask ourselves then. To what extent does the Great Commission influence your personal plans and vision for your life? And secondly, how intentional are you about seeking to enhance the gospel in your different contexts and life situations? Personally, I find Paul's example really challenging because hand in heart, I can't say that my own personal plans and vision for my life are always congruent with the Lord's plan and vision in my life. It's a bit like a partial eclipse for me. So I wonder if this, this morning if the same is true for you. Is the plan and vision for your own life consistent and complementary to the commands of the Great Commission? Like Paul, are you consumed and motivated by the love of God to serve other people? Or does the plan and vision for your own life pivot more towards serving your own needs, serving your own interests? As I say, the chances are you're probably a lot like myself where your plans vacillate between your own plans and the Lord's plans were kind of dragged one way or the other. You've got a foot in both camps. And when that happens, there's always a risk that pre proclaiming the gospel or encouraging other people just becomes a secondary or an infrequent activity in your life. So the lesson for us here, um, I suppose, is that you know, is to be aware of the risk that we can be swayed by our own plans and desires too much. And uh, one way we can show love as a church family is individually and collectively try to emulate or follow Paul's example, having that complete alignment. One way we as a loving church family is to have a clear vision and a clear plan for how it is you'll enhance the gospel. How it is you'll build up other people? Do you know how you're going to do that? Or do you just go along, go over the flow, and if the opportunity arises, you maybe do it, maybe you don't. Uh, so my encouragement to everybody this morning would be to get, go to the Lord in prayer, inquire from Him how it is you can best evangelise, how it is you can best edify others in your different contexts, in your different life situations, and then plan how you're going to do it. Don't just leave it to chance. I'll give you an example. I work in a, a, a further edu education institution. I'll, I'll keep it anonymous because it's public. But, uh, but it's a highly secular environment. It's not an easy place where you can go and share your faith. It's not easy to do that. Um, and I, I think it would be fair to say that my workplace is in a season of transition. There's a heaviness about the place. There's the potential for redundancies. The atmosphere isn't that great. 
And one of the things I've tried to do in recent weeks is get a prayer group together with Christians in the, in the building. We're small in numbers. Um, but we met on Thursday, there was only three years, and I don't know about anybody else, but I felt encouraged by it. That we were praying into that stuff, praying into the constancy of God in the midst of the fact that life can change and be unpredictable. He's constant and just clinging to that truth. So there's some hope in it. Otherwise, you just get dragged into it. You're emotionally thrown about in a storm. You know, it's no easy. So that's just one wee thing I've tried to do for myself, just to be intentional about bringing people together so that we can encourage each other and edify one another in a context where it's difficult to achieve that. The second factor involved in evangelism and edifying is the need for flexibility. So verse 5 is a prompt for us to have a plan and have a vision for how we're going to encourage others and enhance the gospel. Then verse 6 is a prompt to keep that plan and vision flexible. You know, make sure it's subject to change, essentially. So let me read verse 6. It says, and perhaps I'll remain with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I go. This verse has got a lot greater context if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse uh, 15 to 16. And in that particular passage, what we learn is, is that Paul had initially planned to travel directly from Ephesus to Corinth. But he changed his mind. He changed his mind and he decided to go to Macedonia and then Corinth. Uh, in these verses it says, <clears throat> Because of this confidence, I would planned to come to you first so that you could have a second benefit and to visit you on my way to Macedonia and then come to you again from Macedonia and be helped by you on the journey to Judea. What's important to stress here is the reaction of the, the church in Corinth to Paul's change in plans. It was less than positive. There was false teachers that worked within that church that tried to use that situation to discredit them. So what they basically said was, if he can't be relied upon uh, regarding his attentions, then how can we rely on him about doctrine? If he's going to change his mind, if he's independent, if we can't depend on him for this, how can we depend on him for that? But what the ch church had failed to recognise is that Paul was neither indecisive or unreliable. He was just rather, he was just realistic and humble about what he could do in service to the Lord. He was realistic because he recognised that there's many things in, that happen in life that can cause us to change course. And he was humble because he rested under the sovereignty of God. And he was aware that God might alter these plans according to his will. Indeed, if you read in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 17 to 18, we essentially read that that's the reason Paul came base to the church when he pushes back against these allegations. He says, Now when I planned this, was of like two minds, or what I planned, do I plan in purely human way, so that I say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. So what we read here is even Paul himself recognised that on a human level, his plans for ministry work were subject to change and they needed to be flexible to accommodate fluid and changing circumstances. However, what he stresses in verse 18 is regardless of these changes, God is faithful. God is faithful anyway. So what, as a church family, what can we learn about this aspect of the passage? Well, we have all got competing demands in our life. There's often situations can change without much notice. You know, our lives can alter suddenly. So no matter uh, how noble our intentions, none of us are able to do what all we would like to do in service to the Lord. We might plan to do something and then we can't. <coughs> so there's times like Paul, we might need to change course should our circumstances change, or they might even feel led in a different direction by the Spirit of the Lord. So whilst we're encouraged to have a plan for how it is we're going to reach the lost and build people up, it needs to be grounded in realism, and it needs to be open to the Lord's revision. We've all got families, we've all got jobs, we've all got a host of commitments in our lives that need our energy and needs our attention. So for most of us, it's not going to be possible to follow Paul's examples. You're not going to be able to sail the seven seas, traverse mountains to proclaim the gospel. But what we can do is we can follow his example of realism. We can follow his example of humility concerning our service to the Lord as part of this church family. I think I speak for everyone in saying nobody in the church family would want anybody to serve out a place of pressure, to serve, to overextend themselves out of some sense of obligation 
are to please other people. As Mark preached recently, our intentionality to serve should flow from our intimacy with Christ. That's it. So any plans that we make should stem from our relationship with him. And we should rely on his promptings through his spirit to guide and lead our decisions around how it is we serve the church. Trusting that he'll equip us through his grace to serve him effectively according to his will and his way. If you recall in his sermon two weeks ago, Mark pointed out that because we possess faith, we are able to bear fruit and do good, the good works which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. So we don't need to feel guilt or pressure to do more in the church. Rather, we should seek the Lord in faith and he'll make it clear to us, he'll make it clear to you what you should do in his name and his way for his glory. Now, all of what I've just shared should be taken as a preface to what I'm about to say about how to serve the church. <laughs> uh, but I did notice recently the website's been updated and there's now a page that's dedicated for the church's vision about Ridry. There's a dedicated page. And the following verse is, is included in the web page, which I think forms the basis of the church's vision for the new, for the new plant. So it's John 15, verse 16, it says... You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit, and your fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So the vision itself relates to different areas of ministry work and outreach that the, work, uh, the church is going to undertake in the coming months in the local area. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity to serve the church uh, as we look ahead. Indeed, there's a wide door for effective ministries upon us. Uh, so if you haven't seen the web page yet, I would strongly encourage you to have a look at, it, look at it and just prayerfully consider how it is you might serve the church once the building's up and running in Ridry. However, as I said, it's important to be realistic about that. Uh, and it's essential that you seek the Lord's guidance in that as well. <clears throat> so I thought I'm just going to be down for a bit in the next one. So the third factor involved in evangelism and edifying is commitment. So if we look at verse 7, it says, I don't want to see you just now in passing, since I hope to spend time with you if the Lord allows. So Paul's statement that he hoped to uh, spend some time with the church, he was going to be there a while, that's what he's meaning by that. Uh, and that suggests that he recognised that any effective ministry would only uh, be realised if he was prepared to be further and dedicated in his efforts to serve the Lord. So verse 6 is a call for us to be flexible in ministry, and verse 7 is a call for us to be committed and faithful in our work for the Lord. So what we learn from Paul in this passage is that to evangelise and edify others takes tremendous effort, it takes a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of earnestness. Without doubt, it's a demanding process. It will ask questions of you physically, emotionally, and certainly spiritually. This point's emphasised by John MacArthur in his, his commentary uh, when he says the following concerning the need for commitment and mission. So he says this, The Great Commission cannot be fulfilled with anything less than thoroughness. Evangelism, making disciples of all nations, is only the beginning to go on and teach new converts to observe all that Jesus commanded as a long and demanding process. It cannot be done quickly, carelessly, or superficially. So let's be clear, church family, if we're going to be effective in mission, then we need to be further in our efforts to proclaim the gospel, and we need to be committed to that endeavour. Indeed, any plans, any intentions we have about ministry work will be worthless unless it's underpinned by a commitment and a conviction to see them through. So a characteristic of a loving church family is one which is committed and steadfast in its convictions to serve the Lord. The truth is, we can only expect our church to grow if we, like Paul, engage in the Lord's work in a way that's strategic, wholehearted, and faithful. So I think, you know, my, 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 my encouragement would be that we would pray as a church that we would mirror the same commitment and love Paul demonstrated towards the Corinthian church as we, street to, uh, sorry, as we seek to proclaim the good news of our risen saviour in Deniston and Ridry and beyond. 
If we look at uh, verses 8 and 9, these focus on the next factor that's relevant to evangelism and edifying, and that is opposition to ministry. It says, <clears throat> But I'll stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a wide door for effective ministry is open for me, yet many oppose me. So in these two verses, Paul emphasizes that his decision to remain in Ephesus sorry, is twofold. The first one is that there's an abundant opportunity for ministry, and two, that there is many who oppose the advancement of the gospel. If we narrow in in verse 8, we see that the abundant opportunity for ministry is, uh, in Ephesus is emphasized by Paul's use of the phrase, wide door. I don't know, has anybody ever tried to describe what a door is? It's, it's quite tricky. It's not something I just know. But I had a wee look. So my question is, look, how, how would you describe a door? Well, it's an entrance. It's a gateway into some place or other. It's essentially a, a way in. So it makes sense that by definition then, the wider the door, the easier it will be for you to find a way in to whatever it is you're trying to gain entry. So by using the analogy of a wide door, Paul stressing that he's found an easy way in to the hearts and the minds of the Ephesians. And he was keen then to stay on and uh, build, build in that opportunity. But nevertheless, he caveats that statement by stressing that despite the door being wide, there's many who oppose him. But what's important to note here, rather than being despondent or discouraged by that, uh, Paul seems to have reveled in opposition. He welcomed it. And that gives rise to the question, why would they view opposition in a positive light when normally we would see a situation like that as being difficult, something that would be hard to walk through? Why is he so optimistic about it? So what appears to have galvanised Paul's resolve is that he seemed to recognise a fundamental truth associated with ministry work, and that is the greater the opposition being experienced, the greater the Lord's work has been done. That's the flip side of it. So we need to appreciate that if any effective ministry will always give rise to opposition, it's unavoidable. The enemy will always strive to frustrate and hinder the work of the Lord. If you're in fire for Jesus, the devil will turn the hose on you. He'll try and put the flames out. So we shouldn't be surprised when opposition occurs, but we shouldn't be discouraged by it either. Like Paul, we should see it as a positive sign that we're winning hearts, minds and souls for Jesus. And if we can learn anything from Paul's example, is that we should embrace opposition as a challenge, not shy away from it, because wherever opposition exists, so does a wide door for effective ministry. If we look at the beginning of verse 8, we see that Paul was re resigned to remaining in Ephesus until Pentecost in order to tackle the opposition being encountered. And these specific challenges he was facing are detailed in the book of Acts, chapter 19. I would encourage you to look at it just now if you've got a Bible, and we'll kind of talk through the specific challenges that he was determined to, to tackle. But in summary, Ephesus was a city that was corrupted by poor theology, occult practices, demonism, racism, and religious conflict were rife. Idolatry was rampant in the city, and it was centered around the temple of Diana, or Artemis, uh, who was a Roman goddess that many people worshipped at that point in time. If we examine the, the chapter in detail, we see that Paul was determined to challenge the skewed doctrine of that believers had been taught by false teachers in the city. So verses 1 to 7, we see that when he first arrived, arrives in Ephesus, he immediately spent time teaching new believers so that they were clear about the practices and beliefs of the Christian faith. He then spent a period of three months teaching in synagogues, attempting to bring new, content, uh, new converts to faith. And he spent a further two years preaching the word to the Lord of all the residents of Asia. And that's detailed in verses 8 through 10. He also performed miracles. He cast out demons. He rebuked false exorcists in the Lord's name. And that is all referred to in verses 11 through 19. But what was most striking about this chapter is that despite all the opposition he encounters, despite the fact he's surrounded in brokenness, despite it seeming like an impossible situation, 
the law, the law, the word of the Lord spread, and not only did it spread, it ultimately prevailed, and that's detailed in verse 20. So that's something I think we should all take great comfort from, because it tells us no matter how messed up things seem, no matter how much opposition we might encounter, God's plan and purpose for the world will not be denied. The evil one may set out to frustrate God's plan, but he cannot derail it. He'll always preach lies, but the truth of the Lord cannot be denied. So we can all take comfort and courage for the fact that where opposition exists, the truth will flourish. And not only will it flourish, it will ultimately prevail. And I think that's something we should take encouragement from, is, is we kind of try to proclaim the word in a, in a culture that is largely secular and increasingly God-denying. There's a couple of practical things I think we can take from a church family for these verses. And the first thing that we can do in terms of opposition is to support other churches. Just similar to what TJ has just asked us to pray on. That's one way that we can respond to opposition. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that we can do is consider how it is we might confront the opposition we experience within our own culture. So in the first point, I think we can show church, uh, so show love as a, as a church family, as I say, through seeking to support and serve in other churches who are experiencing challenges and difficulties. That's essentially what Paul does in verse 1 through 7 in chapter 19 of Acts. A couple of weeks ago, Mark reminded us all that it's important to recognise that whilst churches are slightly different in terms of how they look and maybe even what they believe, ultimately we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And in the book of Acts, we see that Paul did not forgo the believers who had adopted a skewed uh, theology. Rather, he sought to support them and encourage them and teach them. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that all other churches have got a skewed theology and that we need to correct them. I just think there's a, there's a bigger principle at play here. And that is, is that although churches may look and feel different, we all share in God's grace and based on that understanding, we can be praying that God will cause us to grow in affection and help us to partner with other churches as brothers and sisters in Christ. The truth is this, folks. Look, I don't think churches can afford to operate as independent silos within a culture which has rejected the faith. There's a need to come together where we can. And I really feel that God's calling us as churches to have respect and have a mutual dependence in one another. TJ talked about it last week. He said... You know, we're all part of this universal global church. So it's important where it makes sense, and I emphasise that, where it makes sense and where it's possible that we partner with other churches and we lend our support and our affection to them eh, wherever we can. And with that in mind, I would ask you to keep Springburn Baptist Church, Shettleston Baptist Church firmly in your prayers, the church, churches that TJ's mentioned this morning as well. And we can give thanks to the Lord for the links that we've got with these churches and the opportunities that exist to strengthen our connections with him. And just to be praying that our relationships will continue to grow and that he'll make it clear to us how we might help these other churches as a church family. The second point to consider is how, how might we challenge uh, opposition uh, to the gospel in, a, in our current culture? And there is no easy answers to that, but I'm going to attempt to give some. Uh, if we look at the book of Acts, we see that Paul attempted to challenge opposition to the gospel through apologetics and gospel proclamation. It says in Acts 19, verses 8 and 9, Paul entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But some of them became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd. He withdrew from them, taking the disciples and conducted discussions every day in a lecture hall in Tyrannus. So one of the things I get for these verses is, is that no matter how bold we might be or how well we might plead the case for Jesus, not everyone's going to be persuaded and not everyone will respond positively. Your words will often fall in deaf ears. They'll fail to penetrate hardened hearts. And as a consequence, you'll get rejected. You'll be misunderstood. You might even be slandered or ridiculed. However, the key thing in this is not to be despondent by it, if that happens. Rather, just recognise it's normal to be expected. Ultimately, our job is not to convince someone of the truth of the gospel. 
Our job's just to speak the message of Christ. We're in the input business, not in the outcome business. Salvation's a matter for God. And it's him who pers persuades us to believe the truth of the gospel. It's not even our decision whether to believe it or not. It's a gift from our creator to us. So if we take it personally when people don't respond positively, or we get dis uh, discouraged by it, we're operating for the belief that we, it's us that brings the person to faith. That's an error. All we can do is speak the truth. Leave the results up to God. It's a matter for him. So how might we speak truth in light of our cultural context? Well, in the time of, uh, Paul, during Paul's time in Ephesus, one of the main obstacles of opposition was to, revolved around the worship of the female uh, goddess Diana or Artemis. And the beliefs that centred around Diana not only influenced the, the religious sphere of Ephesus, it shaped the social, the political, the economic and the educational systems of the city. So in short, the cult of Diana had an iron grip in Ephesian society, and Ephesian culture. Now clearly the worship of Diana is not a, a problem for us in the modern world. But nevertheless, idolatry persists in our time. And it's as equally problematic in hardening people's hearts against the gospel. There's loads of sources of idolatry in the modern world. But I would contend that the worship of ourselves is now its most pervasive form. We no longer idolise false gods. We idolise ourselves in a way that would be alien to previous generations and, and previous cultures. I'm halfway through a book with a theologian, a theologian called Carol Truman. And it's called The Rise and the Triumph in a Modern Self. And one of the things he, he sets out to do in the book is explain the changing face of Western culture and how as Christians we can best respond to that. And one of the things he highlights in the book is that <clears throat> in previous generations and previous cultures derived their sense of self, the story about who, who they were, who they told themselves they were and what mattered in life. Uh, and in previous generations, that all came from ex external structures, external sources. So in other words, a person's identity and the values that they held were determined by their connections to their family, to their church, to their community, to their occupation, and even their nation. So put simply, other people told you who you were and what mattered in life. In our modern world, though, all these sources of identity and meaning are now viewed as a barrier to a, a person becoming their authentic self. And because of that, we've now moved to a position where your identity, uh, where it previously came from external, external structures, it's now entirely internal. Put simply, it's our feelings and our feelings alone that determine our identity and what matters in life. There's a sociologist called Philip Reef, and he dubs this what he calls the psychological man. And there's philosophers, Charles Taylor, Alistair McIntyre, they refer to it as the expressive individual. So the harsh truth is that we're now living in a time where any external influence in your identity or your personal values is seen as an attack in your individuality. And it's to be done away with. It's to be done away with. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, we are now living in a time in history where your family might be considered a constraint and a barrier to your experience in your authentic self, and it should be done away with. Indeed, any external influence, influence in your self-concept might be seen as a constraint and a barrier to your experience, your authentic self, and it's to be done away with. But critically, for us as a church, Christianity and faith in Christ is now undoubtedly viewed as a constraint and a barrier to an individual finding them, finding their authentic self, and it's to be done away with. And that's one of the major reasons we'll find opposition to the gospel. We're a culture of self actualizers whose eternal experience and internal narrative is the only truth that matters. And for that reason, the worship of self is the Artemis or the Diana Urage. And it's the principal reason that the, the gospel will fall on deaf ears and it will fail to penetrate the hearts and minds of those who we would seek to evangelise and edify. <clears throat> so that's the bad news. So how, how do you respond to that? As I've said, where, where opposition exists, so does opportunity and blessing. So the first thing is not to be discouraged. The word of the Lord will spread and it will prevail regardless of cultural conditions. So we can look forward with confidence and expectation about what the Lord might do as we seek to evangelise. 
and edif edifier us. So like Paul, we can boldly set out to persuade others about the kingdom of God. But what would you tell someone if this is the kind of cultural framework we're existing in? Well, for me anyway, I think our message to people is that salvation is not found in itself. It, salvation is found in a saviour who can provide people all that they would need and desire in life. You know, the key message being propagated in our culture is that the route to happiness, the route to personal satisfaction, rests in us being able to form and move towards an ideal and authentic self. I'd question if that's even possible. Are you capable, capable of formulating a version of yourself that you're completely and undeniably happy with? To me, that's like trying to grab the fog. You can see it, you can sense it, but you can never seize hold of it. The truth is this, we're all broken and fallen individuals who consistently fall short. The reality is that you can never, ever be the best version of yourself. You simply cannot rely on yourself to ever get that right. We do not and we will not ever measure up. And that's the point. Jesus does that for you. And when we put our faith in him, we surrender a sense of self that's corrupted by deceitful desires. And we put on a, a new self, one which is a created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. When we make a decision to follow Christ, we close the door in a sense of self which leaves us grasping and fearful about our needs. And we embrace a new identity rooted in our relationship with Christ, which means you can face any challenge or any circumstance in this life with courage and hope. We can never find identity and meaning in a sense of self which is from our own invention. We can only ever find it in him. So my message to anyone who doesn't know the Lord this morning is this. Make a decision to invite Christ into your life by denying yourself. Follow in him. Let it be Christ and Christ alone who defines your identity, not yourself. For it's by making him king of your heart that we embrace our authentic identity as a child of God. And we gain a sense of meaning and purpose in life which will see us through any trial or any tribulation. More broadly, I would suggest that our culture's bondage to expressive individualism is the root cause of all the political and all the so social chaos we've seen over the last uh, few weeks. For decades now, we've embraced a worldview that has significantly weakened the social structures that used to bring us all together. We're dissipating. Practically for my whole life, the message for our culture has been that the individual is king. The individual is king over our families. The individual is king over our communities. The individual is, is king over God. And what's been the result of that? What's been the result of the embracement of that expressive individualism? individualism? We now live in a severely weakened society which is unable to provide support for those who most need it. The truth is that many people are living in great despair now because we've systematically dismantled the societal structures that bound us together. And the consequence of this is that now many people are out there without much hope. So my message to anyone who doesn't know the Lord this morning is this. There is a loving church family that you can be part of here. There's a loving church community that you can be part of here. There's a global body of Christ which is rooted in a shared faith and a shared hope in Christ Jesus to which you can be belong. You are not alone. And we would be excited to speak to you if you wish to uh, know more. I edited a whole section of this this morning, folk, but just very briefly, I, I re for us, I, I really feel revival is coming. I really, really sense it. I really do. I had a big thing to share with you, but I'm not going to. But one of the things that, uh, one of the things when I mentioned Amos earlier, that, you know, the prophets always proclaimed judgment and it was always bad news, but it always ended in a note of hope that Israel's fortunes would be restored. And we're in a period of exile. But our fortunes will be restored, and I'm starting to sense it. But these wee churches TJ's mentioned, and there's micro revivals, micro revivals that will become more fun to a macro revival. I really feel it's going to harm. There's been four prophetic words given about uh, the church in Ridry over the last year. And for one of you, you might remember the guy from Cap came and he talked about the church being a church that would emanate a light, uh, which would exceed its size, its power, and its scope. So we're small in numbers, but they've got the potential to carry a light, a light of hope, and there's a whole bunch of folk out there needing it. 
So just very quickly, I know I'm going to review it, but verses 10 to 12 focus on the final factor relevant to evangelism and edifying. And that's just the need for uh, togetherness. So verse 10, it says, If Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear while with you, because he is doing the Lord's work just as I, I am. So let no one look down on him. Send him on his way in peace so that he can come to me, because I'm expecting him with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to come with you, the brothers, but he was not willing to come now. However, he will come when he has an opportunity. So what's essentially emphasised in these verses is just the need for teamwork as we, essential, as we seek to evangelise and edify others as a church. Paul wrote regularly about <coughs> his dependence on the Lord as he, as he sought to undertake ministry, but it's also fair to say that he depended on other believers as he was doing that. If you read Romans 16, you, get, you see that he dedicates a large section of that, that chapter to thanking those who have partnered with him uh, and his work with the Lord. And we see that same idea being expressed in these verses uh, and, and by uh, Paul at requesting that the Corinthians treat Timony, uh, Timothy sorry, with the same respect. You know, he says specifically, no one is to look down on him or give him cause to fear. So as a church family, it's important that we recognise that whatever role we have in the church, that we treat each other with the same respect and the same dignity. As Mark preached recently, none of us are special. We're all just ordinary folk resting under God's grace. So there's no spiritual giants in this church. There's just no spiritual giants. None of us are more important than the next person. So we've all got a valid and important role to play in the life of this church. And that's true, is we're all equal in it. So as we move forward as a church, let's do so with a spirit of dependence on the Lord, but in one another, in unity, working as a team. At times that might involve us being sensitive to how the Holy Spirit is leading our fellow believers, and that's essentially the point Paul is making in verse 12. You know, it was Paul's conviction that Apollos visited the Corinthian church, but Apollos wanted to go later. And whilst Paul fought differently, he respected these, uh, Paul's decision to wait, is they recognise that God will use uh, people in different ways at different times. Just to finish though, the main thing that we should take from both these verses is if we are one in Christ, then we're one in each other. And if the work of the church is the Lord's work, then we must all work together in him because ultimately we're all one in him. So folks, as we think about the future in Deniston and Ridgeway, let us move forward as one body who respects and cares for one another as we seek to serve the Lord with leading his spirit and his divine guidance. <sighs> so in a moment, I'm just going to finish with prayer, but before we do, I would just invite any, anyone uh, with faith to come up and show their faith in the Lord be taken for the bread and the cup. And as you do that, just, just, just hold in mind that uh, it's through the power of the resurrection that ultimately we're all unified in the Lord. It's him that binds us together. And it's through the power of the resurrection that we're received and we receive an identity in Christ. He's our hope. He's our salvation. In Christ alone, our hope is found. Let me pray, folks. So, Lord, we give thanks for our time together this morning. I pray that each of us would be challenged by all that we've heard and your spirit would prompt us to change wherever necessary so that our plans and our aspirations in life are brought into deeper alignment with your plan and purpose for our life. May you make it clear to each of us, gathered here, how we can best serve you in your way for your glory. And may you help us to formulate a plan for how we can carry this out in our different contexts and in our different life situations. Amen.